Good evening, fellow ruminators. Welcome back to another session. Rumination with Andrew, thank you so much for joining as we are about to discuss a very important topical matter. And uh, this evening, we shall be talking about the educational system in Jamaica. And I have been observing a recent article was published in the Jamaica Gleaner recently talking about teachers um, being imported into Jamaica. That means that the Jamaican government is desirous of um, having teachers uh, come to Jamaica or go to Jamaica. And because, you know, they're having uh, a, a mass exodus, as it were, of teachers leaving the island. So they are replacing these teachers with foreign teachers. So we have here on, this was July 15th, 2024, an article titled Education Ministry Recruiting Foreign Teachers for New Academic Year. And this is coming from the Gleaner. The Ministry of Education and Youth will be employing various teacher retention strategies for the 2024-2025 academic year, which begins in September. So let me repeat that because I think that I wasn't clear. The Ministry of Education and Youth will be employing various teacher retention strategies for the 2024-25 academic year, which begins in September. Acting Chief Education Officer Terrian Thomas Gale advised that teachers are being sought from various countries. And I just look at the countries from which they are being sought. We're currently, and she's, this is her quote now, we have currently engaged Nigeria, Ghana, the Philippines, and India. So we are looking all over, she said in a response to a question posed during the ministry's Region 6 2024 Back to School Conference at the Jamaica Pegasus Hotel in New Kingston today. The conference was held under the theme, Shaping the Future, STEM or STEAM, and the transformation agenda. So here we see where the prime minister and the government at large, we got to say the Jamaican government, is seeking to employ teachers from abroad, from Nigeria, from Ghana, from the Philippines, right? And it seems other foreign countries because of the exodus of teachers leaving the Jamaican educational system. Now, what does that bode for bode for Jamaica? What does that really imply? in terms of our educational system moving forward from here. Now, in the Garden newspaper some time ago, we had where um, there's an article entitled, um, or titled, Jamaica Needs Teachers, Yet England Coaches Them and Classrooms Lie Empty. How can that be right? Now, this was written by Gus John, and said people want good lives for themselves, but the UK has taken so much from the Caribbean, better to help the islands thrive. Gus John is an academic and equality and human rights campaigner, and this article was written on Friday, April 5th, 2024. Does it matter if we in England are recruiting teachers so heavily in Jamaica that the classrooms there don't have enough of them? Ask those who run school systems in the Caribbean that desperately need their brightest and best. People will always want to be mobile. The issues are in what numbers and why and how? Now listen to what he's saying here. When I became director of education in Hackney in 1989, the first black person to hold such a post, there was a massive shortage of primary school teachers and secondary maths and science teachers across the country. I recruited 55 teachers in Trinidad to come to work in Hackney, 50 in primary schools and five in secondary schools. They had all been made redundant by their government on the order of international monetary fund. Right, So they had been made redundant, redundant by their government on the order of the International Monetary Fund, the IMF, as part of a structural adjustment program. I insisted on three things. One, that they would come to England as family units unless they were single. Two, that Hackney would be responsible for finding them accommodation and school and college places for their children and would help to find employment for their spouses who were not teachers. And three, that they would all be supported to gain qualified teacher status and graduate and postgraduate qualifications. So here we have a scenario, a situation in which we have teachers leaving the Caribbean to go to these so-called first world countries, primarily to Great Britain and to the United States. Because every year we have recruiters, teaching recruit, recruitment um, organizations going to Jamaica to recruit the best and brightest of our teachers. Now, I don't have a problem with the Jamaican government importing teachers from other countries, but my only 
caveat is, do they understand the culture? Will they be able to adapt to the culture of the language, the language culture that we have in Jamaica, for example? And we know that we have different, you know, Creoles in, in Africa, for example, in, in Ghana, in Nigeria, but we do not have the same Creole. Um, Jamaican Creole does not necessarily share the same linguistic um, patterns with them. Yes, we, you know, lots of people say our language came from um, the Twi or, yeah, I can't remember the pronunciation of that. That's the language of the languages spoken in Ghana. But yet still, it's not mastered by them. Right, the 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 Ghanaians are not going to just speak Jamaican Creole overnight, and we need teachers who can understand the language of communication in the classroom. We're not suggesting here that they should promote the Creole in the classroom, but the yet still is still the language of contact between the teacher and the student. And if you are going to teach well, you must understand the native tongue, the native language of the students. And most of our students, whether we like it or not, right, um, they use the Creole and sometimes teachers have to traverse. They have to straddle between the Creole and standard English to allow the students to understand what they're saying, to explain very difficult topics. So are we going to have these uh, new imported teachers learn the Jamaican Creole and master it in time for their uh, you know, uh, performing discharging of their duties before they begin to discharge their duties? Are we going to do that? Do we have the time? Do we have the economic resources to do that, to train them into the Jamaican language? Another thing I'm, you know, culturally, we also have to understand the cultural, the culture of poverty that is so endemic and that is so ubiquitous in Jamaica. And the only Jamaican teacher will understand that and will be able to, you know, assist the student, understand the psychological effects that poverty has on our children. Will the teachers coming from the Filipinos, for example, from the Philippines rather, and from other nations um, outside of Jamaica, will they be able to understand the entrenched poverty that we have in Jamaica. Yes, they have poverty in their countries too, but we know that different culture deal with their poverty in a different way. And there is a sort of understanding that they will have to have of this culture, this pervasive culture of poverty that is so endemic in Jamaica. Now we're concerned also that the, the brightest of of the, the best of the best, the creme de la creme of our teachers are leaving. And I am not sure if Jamaica is able to pay the best of the best who are coming from Africa, coming from Ghana, coming from Nigeria and the Philippines and among other nations. I do not know if we can offer them an attractive salary for them to the best of the best to be attracted to Jamaica because we understand also that the United States recruit um, teachers from the Philippines, for example, I'm not sure about Ghana or Nigeria, possibly they perhaps do recruit teachers from these countries also, right? So if we do not have an attractive wage offer, attractive emolument package, do you think that we are going to attract the smartest teacher from these countries? I'm not sure if we're thinking carefully what we're doing. Now, it is very interesting, Jamaica is always a place that is very difficult to understand. I think that the country is almost, what's the word now? It's like we're an enigma. It's an, enig an enigmatic, enigmatic country. Jamaica is certainly an enigma because, you know, we recently we were talking about salary increases for teachers. Right? And now we are talking about lots of teachers to leave it. So it means, therefore, that I'm not sure if the teachers really received the salary increases that were purported, that were suggested by the Minister of Education, Fable Williams. I am not sure if they are receiving those attractive salaries as they were reported. It seems to me that it might be only, you know, um, slated for people in the administrative level. The administrative level, it's not for people, the rank and file, 
educator, the rank and file teacher in the classroom. It doesn't seem that they increase in salary, the salary packages uh, that we were told have been increased and sometimes some of them double, triple fold. I am not sure if that applies to them because it seems that we're still having a mass exodus of teachers. Now, I, I'm in fairness to the Minister of Education, she's saying that this year we have seen a decline in the number the numbers of teachers leaving. But is that true? Can that be verified? Is that verifiable? Can the principals, you know, respond? If there is any principal from the Jamaican schools um, and you're watching this video, could you verify whether or not you have a mass exodus this year in comparison to former years? Or, or have you seen, as Fable Williams, the Minister of Education, is suggesting, is asserting that this year we do not have a mass exodus. We have seen a decline in the numbers of teachers who are leaving the island. Now, in the Jamaica Observer, there was an article that was published on April 6, 2024, and it says here, British classrooms calling and UK offering 2 million relocation package plus other incentives to Jamaican teachers. So here we're seeing a lot of, you know, different UK schools are offering Jamaicans, what it seems, what it appears to be attractive salaries. Now, Jamaicans have to be careful because when you see the, sometimes we compare the salaries between the two countries and the differences, and you might think because you're, let us say you're going to earn uh, 2,500 uh, pounds per month, but you have to also take into consideration the cost of living in wherever you go in, in the UK, which is very astronomical. Right? Even in the United States now, depending on what city you go to, the cost of living is extremely astronomical. But I know that we do cut and curve. Jamaican teachers know how to you know, live frugally and stuff like that. So I understand that. But you have to don't think that you're going to live now uh, you know, lives that are you know, um, luxurious because you hear that it's two thousand or you know three thousand dollars and you begin to convert it into the local currency but you can't convert it like that because the united states and great britain are, you know and jamaica have different standards of living and there are things that you will need in these first world countries that you perhaps do not need in jamaica such as you know hot water you're going to need where well, that is basic you know things like you know heating up your home and also air conditioning these are things that are luxurious in Jamaica. You don't, well, you don't need to be heated. Your house does not need to be heated in Jamaica because we live in a tropical climate. So you have to make sure you also have to buy clothes, seasonal clothing, right? You just have one type of clothes because Jamaica is an eternal spring, summer, right? That is there. So you don't need to buy constantly new clothes or seasonal clothing. But when you go to these countries, you will have to buy seasonal clothing. Another thing is for the, the children, if you have children and the cultural exchange can sometimes be very different and can be a shock uh, for your children. But children tend to ad adjust and adapt to these new environmental um, situations than adults do. Now, yeah, so here in this article, it says that almost 500 qualified Jamaican teachers swapped local classrooms for classrooms in the United Kingdom, the UK last year, as that country increased its recruitment drive to fill teaching vacancies in its schools. Something that is also very ironic here is that in Jamaica, we tend to criticize our teachers and we see that they're not doing enough and they have not really taught the students well, but yet still, we are seeing every year these recruitment organizations going to Jamaica to recruit Jamaican teachers. So it's obviously that they are performing when they go abroad. So why are they not performing in Jamaica, according to the Jamaican authorities? If you listen to carefully to what they say, the teachers are the ones um, who are not performing and they should be paid by performance. Now, if they are doing so well, because if they were not doing well, obviously, these organizations would not be coming there because they can go to many other countries to recruit teachers. But obviously, in these countries, our teachers are spoken of very highly. They have very high regards for the teachers, for Jamaican teachers. And that is why they go back every year to recruit a large number of teachers. 500 leaving to the UK, a lot of teachers leaving to one place. 
and we have other recruitment centers in the United States, perhaps in Canada and other locations around the world, could be in Grand Cayman also, where teachers are highly sought after. So what is happening in Jamaica? Why are they not performing? That is the question. You know, but I must say, when we look at our educational system, when we look at the physical plant, the campus, right, that we have in Jamaica, a lot has not changed. A lot has not changed. We still have these iron metal chairs, you know, that must have been there from the 1950s, perhaps before. We are not modernizing our classrooms that we should be, we should be modernizing our classrooms, put our people to work and let them build modern chairs. Chairs that look more appealing. The classrooms in Jamaica for the most part do not look appealing. The classrooms need to be painted. The chairs need to be changed. They're, they're too ancient, right? I, I see chairs that are there from that when, you know, from when the devil was a boy. Right? It's time now that we upgrade and that we begin to modernize. Look at how first world classrooms look and let us begin to pattern those classrooms. And I also need, um, think we need to also build centers on these school plants, these physical campuses. We need to build buildings, study halls, study centers where students can go and sit and they can um, actually study. In fact, I think we should make it mandatory to have maybe an hour of the day. I know that Westwood and St. Hilda's did this. They had what they call a prep session. So after school was finished at 2.30, they would sit there for an hour or so in silence and they would study. I think we need to revisit those days and have our students sit in a big hall, a big study hall where they're also probably fed a meal per day. The government need to arrange that. We have too much money that we are wasting, wasting on frivolous things that should be put into educating our kids. And some of our kids, the home, the home environment is not conducive to studying. So if they, if we can create these plants, these campuses, or you know, where you have a big hall, a big study hall in which students can go to study after school is finished, maybe at school finishes at two o'clock or 2.30, two and they should sit there, a mandatory sitting in silence where work is done. When I say silence, I mean they can be grouped up and if they need to work with another person, but it shouldn't be any noise. It should be um, a sort of environment in which they can concentrate on what they're doing, right? We need to do some of these things so that we can help our students to study, to do their homework and to study for their exams and to be productive. Because after they have been sent home, many times, many of the homes are not conducive for studying. They have no electricity or perhaps they have nothing to eat or the home environment is just loud and parents are not responsible to you know, encourage their students to do assignments. So if the school can help students in doing that, then I think that's going to be a big help. And over the years, you know, when Westwood was doing that, the prep session that they had, they did very well. I'm not sure if they're still doing that, but they did very well academically at the school because they kept that one hour session where students could sit down and do homework and reflect. They need to learn how to reflect and to think, right? Because we're living in a knowledge society and we need to have, um, more silence sometimes. We need to have moments of silence where our people, particularly our students, can sit down and they can be engaged intellectually. That is very important. And I would hope that the Minister of Education, along with the government, will think of doing something like that. All schools, all public schools should have a big study hall center with appropriate seating. And these are things that we can sit down and, you know, begin to plan out and to see how we can use our carpenters and, you know, other people who work in that sort of profession to build, you know, um, chairs and other things that students might need and tables, right? So that we can seat our children comfortably. But all these metal chairs I'm seeing in the classroom, they need to go and the school environment need to change. I saw um, Simon Romero, who is a writer for the New York Times, and he was commenting 
about the teachers leaving Jamaica to go to to go to uh, United States and how are this mass exodus of teachers leaving Jamaica um, for the United States. And he was, you know, he showed some picture, but, you know, Simon Romero, he likes to show pictures of the worst. Um, I was in, interviewed by him and I'm not sure what sort of quotations he, he, he actually included in the article that he had written about the Jamaican Creole after contacting me. That was a terrible quote that he included in his article. And I'm calling you out, Simon Romero. You shouldn't have done that. There were lots of other substantive things that I said, and what you it was just totally out of context what you did. But you know, he was showing some pictures of the school system, of you know, of the different classrooms in Jamaica, and they were not attractive, to say the least. Right? They just look like a classroom of the 1940s. Right? We need to upgrade our educational system so that our teachers can feel that they are actually in a very productive environment. And our students also, because if the environment is not conducive, if it's not physically attractive, our students are not going to produce and they're not going to respond to learning in a positive manner. The physical environment does affect students' learning process. So I think we need Jamaican you know, professionals need to go to first world countries and we need to look at some of the the best physical environment just look at the, the, the environment and see the layout of the environment the chair the type of chairs that they may use we might not have to do something that is luxurious but something that looks like it's a first world where or we're heading there but right now we look like a fourth world country when you, when you look at the majority of our schools apart from having a whiteboard and you know they have a few computers here and there the classrooms are not in good conditions. And there is no plan as we, as far as we can see, to upgrade. We have to upgrade our schools now. We have to upgrade the physical plant. How are we going to do it? We have to sit down and look at that because that is going to create teacher depression. You know, I remembered when I was, you know, I went to a school in Jamaica. Um, I think it was somewhere in Mall Road uh, in Spanish Town. That was a primary, it was a uh, junior junior school. What do they call it again? These junior schools, these um, uh, all-age school, right? It was an all-age school. And I just could not stay there. It was so depressing. The physical plant was just not attractive, not appealing. You don't want to go inside and interact with the students. And all of our students are, are, were, were not the best in terms of their academic acuity. So, you know, the what incentive are you giving to teachers who have to interact with such, you know, depressing physical plans every day, right? You've got to be able, we've got to be able to do better and we can do better. And I'm not saying that you have to begin with all schools at one given moment, but, you know, let us look at some schools. And I would hope that our, our schools also our schools can do things to earn money. Why not get on YouTube? Some of you are on YouTube, but some of you are not on YouTube. And the ones who are on YouTube, like the York Castles and St. Hilda's and the Westwoods, and I've seen, you know, good job, you're on YouTube, and perhaps you're, some of you are earning some money. But you can also do devotional. Put up devotions on, on your YouTube channel, like um, Glenn, you're doing. Let, 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 you know, past students begin to reflect and to, you know, to begin to reminisce their days and their lives, their you know, time spent at these schools, at Westwoods and the York Castles and the St. Hilda's. And when they do that, they probably will be impressed, you know, will be encouraged, will be motivated, will be incentivized, as it were, to send money to the schools. Do that. Put up more things on YouTube channel, on your Facebook, you know, do more things like these to, you know, to bring back some sort of memories. Right. And I'm sure past students, they're already helping. I'm sure they're already helping, but it will even give them greater incentives. Right. It will provide them greater incentives to further helping to country make, you know, more contributions to the country, right, to um, to the school, not to the country, but to the, that particular school, whether to Westwood or to St. Hilda's or to North Castle, right? We need to do something like that, but our physical plant for the most part, you know, I, I see that I, as I talk about your castle, I think your castle is doing a great job 
in terms of the physical plan. They have done much, a lot to have improved the physical plan. Of course, much more needs to be done. But give the give the the, the, the principal his credit, his due. He has done a significant job since he went to that school. But a lot of our schools are just barely, you know, have just been barely upgraded. It needs much more. And people who go to Jamaica cannot be impressed to see that we're not progressing. You know, we're still in the 1950s, as it were, in terms of the lack of resources. Our physical plant needs much more. And we've got to give our teachers credit. Had it not been for them and their ingenuity, and their creativeness and their innovations. I do not think that, even though we're not doing as well as we should, that many of our children would still even pass a subject, right? And this leads me back now to the sacrifices of our Jamaican teachers because they understand the struggles. They too went through this, a similar struggles, most of them, and they understand it. And for, and for that reason, they will give lunch money and they will you know, spend extra time with students to ensure that they learn whatever they need to learn. Are these teachers coming from Nigeria and Ghana and the Philippines, are they prepared to do the same, right? What about the whole matter of racism in some of these countries like the Filipinos? Are they going to be discriminating against our students? We've got to be able to look at some of these factors. We can't just begin to say, we're just gonna go and get teachers, import teachers like that. And I hope that we will use the underutilized teachers as Favre was saying, the ones that you have sent home, the ones who are in their sixties and, you know, 60 and they're strong and they still have much to offer, get them back into the classroom. They have the knowledge, they have the skills, they have the intellectual acuity, they have the experience most importantly. You have sent all many teachers at six to suffer. Many of them are suffering because, you know, they, 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 their retirement package is so low and they're not surviving very well. So what I would do, I would try to re recruit those teachers who are still strong. Physically, they're still strong and they're still mentally sharp. But most importantly, as I've just suggested, they have the, the experience to help our students to move forward. Because I do not think at this point that the foreign teachers, I'm sure a few might, but they're not going to understand the culture as well as Jamaican teachers do. Okay? They are not going to understand the, 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 the culture as American teachers do, as, as Jamaican teachers do. And we've got to think about that. So this is what I wanted to bring to your attention today, because it seems to me that we're just doing things and, you know, I'm wondering what percentage of the principal, the administrators have been consulted about the importation of foreign teachers to Jamaica? Have they been consulted? What have been their responses to that sort of plan, right? And why are teachers leaving? Why are Jamaican teachers leaving the Jamaican classroom? We all know because they're not being paid well. So what was this salary bruhaha, the increase in salary bruhaha? What, what was it about? Right? Was it not because you wanted to encourage teachers to incentivize them to remain why the government did it, but it doesn't seem like it's true. It seems like it was just a propaganda. I don't know. Maybe it was true. I don't know because it, it you know, a lot of things in Jamaica do not add up. It's not mathing as people will say, right? The math is not mathing. And as a result of that, we're seeing where there are lots of discrepancies, right? Lots of incongruences. Right? Things are just not really, you know, real. It's like we're just living in this delusional state. And the government can get away with lots of things because the journalists, again, are not doing their jobs. Because this article was just a really 
brief article about the importation of, 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 um, of foreign teachers, there was not any investigative report. There was no probing in that article. Right? So I think that we need to look at these situations and to see how we are going to solve this problem. But it's something that is of great concern because it's talking about our educational system and our educational system is already far behind, particularly our neighboring, our neighbors, you know, the neighboring countries, the Caribbean countries, we are behind, right? And if our teachers are good, which of course, internationally, we're seeing that they are good teachers. They have high regards, the United States and the UK and other countries have high regards for Jamaican teachers. Why is it that we are not providing our teachers in Jamaica necessary incentives to remain on the island and to develop our indigenous educational system? That is the question. And we've got to really begin to reflect and to think that our educational system, if we continue to import, is just going to be going backward. It's going to regress because Jamaica, I am sure, does not have the economic wherewithal to import the best and the brightest of the foreign teachers. We don't have that money to do that. And some of these teachers, as I'm suggesting, these countries are already, you know, on the list of the United States. They go there and so of course it's not going to be that they are going to the United States is going to go for the best teachers there. And we are just going to get the the what is left. Right? the mediocre, which we like. We just love mediocrity. So all the mediocre teachers, and I'm not I'm, you know, I'm not trying to now bash these teachers, but we are just not going to get the smartest of teachers as because what we have to do is because the, or, the smartest of our teachers are leaving. So we have to replace them now with the smartest of teachers from other countries, but we are not economically competitive to be able to do that. Right? We're just not. You know, it's very, very ironic, too, that everything, we're always on the wrong side of history. When we should be exporting goods and services abroad, when we should have a, a, an excellent manufacturing base, we're not doing that. We're importing lots of things that we could produce in Jamaica, like, you know, potatoes and, you know, and other things, lots of which we are importing. But we are exporting what we should not be exporting which really are our human resources. I'm not suggesting now that people, if they want to leave, cannot leave, but this leave in this, you know, mass exodus, when we have this mass exodus of our professionals leaving the country, it means there's something that something is fundamentally wrong with that country. Maybe not just the economics, but it could be security, it could be other things, other contributing factors that we have to look at to assess why are our teachers leaving en masse to foreign countries. Thank you so much for joining. Please be sure to like and to share and to subscribe. And I'll see you in another video when I shall, shall up, upload another one. Thank you so much. We'll see you then. Bye.